Hi everyone, I just worked out how to flip the image so now I can read Leonard the Liarbird to you, not back the front. So that's the beauty of live streaming. Hi, I'm Jodie McLeod, I'm the author of Leonard the Liarbird and just like all of you, I am working from home and reading this to you from my home and I have two daughters with me today who may or may not make an appearance. I've set them up um, with some things to do, but if we get an interruption, I apologize, although they're pretty cute, so I don't mind if they interrupt. I hope you don't either. So welcome, thank you for joining in and listening to this live reading of Leonard the Liarbird. Um, I'm so excited to share it with you today, especially in this pretty unnerving time where we're all um, a, a little bit anxious um, about you know what's going on and what the future holds but my feeling is that if we can share stories with each other then um, we'll all be a bit better off and cash in on those storytelling cuddles on the couch yeah we'll all feel a whole lot better so I'm going to read the book to you and show you the beautiful pictures by Eloise Short and then at the end we'll have Rose Stibbard from the Blue Mountains Cultural Centre's Virtual Insight Program asking me a few questions um, and you can also have the opportunity to ask questions in the comments. Um, just type in your questions and I'll get to them at the end and answer as many as I can. Also, you must stay tuned for some really exciting news that I'm going to be talking about at the end of this. Um, so yeah, stick around for after the questions because I'm going to tell you something really cool and exciting about Leonard the Liarbird. All right, without further ado, I'll read you the book Leonard the Liarbird by Jodie McLeod, illustrated by Eloise Short. In the blue mountains in Australia, where the blue gums, where the gum trees breathe a blue tinged mist of eucalyptus, there lived a lyrebird named Leonard. Leonard was born to perform. He loved to act and dance. He loved to play and prance. But most of all, Leonard loved to sing. He could sing the sounds of all the animals in the bush, from koalas and cockatoos to possums and king parrots. Since he could talk to everyone, Leonard had plenty of friends. He'd gossip with the galahs and jabber with the joeys. He'd banter with the bowbirds and make a ruckus with the rosellas. But the one friend Leonard didn't have the one he wanted most of all was another lyrebird. One day, while Leonard was rehearsing his carillon call, he heard a little voice. The simpler the tune, the sweeter the song. It was another lyrebird. I'm Lila, she said with a kind smile, and you must be Leonard. Leonard the Lyrebird, he who can sing every song of every animal in the bush, Leonard said proudly. Then his voice became sad, but also he who can't find a dear friend. I'll tell you what, began Lila, if you sing every song of every animal for me, I will happily be your friend. Without another word, Leonard fanned out his tail feathers and burst into a serenade of sounds. Cuckoo cucka, cuckoo cucka, cuckoo cocker too. Whistle warble, whip crack, twitter tweet woo. Cheep chirp, clickety clack, cackle caw coo. Squawk squeak, squeal screech, woof woof oh. Lila was quiet. That last sound was a dingo. Leonard explained. Dingoes howl and bark, you know. Very clever, said Lila. But you forgot the most impressive song of all. 
What song is that? asked Leonard. When you find it, Lila said with a twinkle in her eye, do come and sing it for me. And with that, she skip hopped away. Leonard was confused. What song was Lila talking about? For the next few days, he tried to think of a song that no animal had sung before. While Leonard was out wandering, he passed by a deep, dark cave. Some believed a bunyip lived in that cave. The bunyip had never been seen or heard, but everyone agreed it must be the most frightening beast in the bush with the most fearsome cry of all. That's it, thought Leonard. She wants to hear the sound of a bunyip. All afternoon, Leonard practiced his bunyip call. By the time it was dark, he was ready to show Lila. Just as he approached, Leonard felt his feathers freeze. A hungry fox was prowling towards Lila. Leonard's heart raced. He knew what he had to do. Under the glow of the blue moonlight, he, stretched, he fanned out his tail feathers, stretching out the biggest quills as wide as they would go. Just as the fox pounced, he erupted with the sound of a bunyip. It was a roar, a cackle, a snort and a growl, a bellow, a grunt, a screech and a howl, a mechanical shriek, a jackhammering shout. All at once the sounds came out. The noise ricocheted off the three sisters and whooshed through Wentworth Falls. It echoed around Mount Solitary and bounced off the narrow neck walls. It swirled around the Jamison Valley and leapt into the gross. It made every animal in the Blue Mountains tremble, so you can imagine how it sounded up close. Oh screamed the fox, bounding away into the bush. But Lila didn't move. She was hurt. Leonard ran to her and began to sing softly. Not the sound of a kookaburra or a koala, not the sound of a possum or a king parrot, just his own gentle tune, a quiet lullaby of twitters and whistles. Slowly, Lila began to blink. That's the song, she whispered. It's your song in your own true voice. But it's so simple, said Leonard. Simple and sweet, said Lila. And so Leonard and Lila were friends. Leonard still performed for the other animals. He even did a bunyip impression for them every now and then. But for Lila, he saved the most simple, sweetest song of all. The end. <laughs> Thank you all so much for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that story and I'm now going to be taken, uh, taking a few questions from Rose Stibbard from the Cultural Centre. Um, let's see here. Oh look, we've got a whole bunch of people listening today. That's exciting. All right. I'll answer Rose's questions as they come in. Are you there, Rose? Otherwise, I've got them here, ready to answer. For those who have just joined us, I've just read Leonard the Lyrebird, but the good thing about these live videos is that they stay um, rolling for about 24 hours. So if you miss that reading, you can probably watch it at some stage today that suits you. But let's answer a few questions by Rose. So Rose has asked me, why did I choose to write? about a lyrebird and this is a very interesting story so when I came to the Blue Mountains first moved to the Blue Mountains nine years ago now I I work from home I'm a writer and I was writing at my kitchen table one day and I heard a beautiful bird call out in the backyard and it was a currawong and then it changed to a rosella and then it changed to a cockatoo and then it changed to some sparrows and I thought is that a whole bunch of different birds 
but no, it was all coming from the one bird. And I watched this performance from a lyrebird in my very own backyard for about 15 minutes. And I just thought this lyrebird has to appear in a children's storybook one day. So I was very inspired by how incredible this bird was at mimicking. Um, so yeah, that's why I decided to write about the lyrebird. And also it's an iconic Blue Mountains bird. So um, I, I really wanted to write a story that was set in the Blue Mountains and the lyrebird just was, yeah, put up its hand as the hands down main character. <laughs> um, so Eloise has also, I'm oh, sorry, Rose has also asked, you worked with illustrator Eloise Short for the images in the book. What was the process like? So Eloise is a wonderful artist who lives in Katoomba and I um, discovered her from her former work as um, or illustrating um, some children's puzzles and for those she illustrated some beautiful uh, Australian bush animals and so I contacted her and um, asked if she wanted to be a part of this project and it just so happened that she really wanted to illustrate a children's book at, at that time as well and I really wanted to write and publish one so we started working together and we just clicked. Um, the process was really easy it was um, Eloise was so wonderful to work with. We sat down once I'd written the story and we went through each page and we talked about what each illustration not only had to show visually, but what emotions it had to communicate. And that could have been down to a very minor detail, or seemingly minor detail, uh, such as the way Leonard's eye was shaped. The eye, you could not believe how much emotion is conveyed through the eye of uh, an animal. So every page we had to make sure the um, emotion was coming across and Eloise was so wonderful um, in, in that process. And she used a special kind of paint called gouache, which meant if she uh, sort of did something that she wanted to correct, she could actually rub it off and redo um, that bit of the painting. So it was helpful if we wanted to tweak illustrations as we went. But yes, it was a wonderful process working with Eloise. She's a very talented artist. Um, so Rose has asked that a number of uh, Blue Mountains landmarks are featured in this book. Um, a number of iconic locations. What is my personal favorite? My personal favorite uh, landmark in the Blue Mountains would probably have to be the view looking out over the Jamison Valley towards Mount Solitary. I just love the idea that there is this lone island of a mountain out there sort of staring back at the cliffs and canyons of the Jamison Valley. Um, it's so majestic and I just am in awe every time I look at it. But in saying that, I love that when you do go for a bushwalk through the Jamison Valley, those three sisters just seem to pop up out of nowhere at lots of different times when you're on the clifftop track. And it's always, always a surprise and a thrill to catch sight of those gorgeous rock formations. So the, the surprising beauty of the Three Sisters never um, ceases to amaze me. Um, Rose has also asked, is Leonard named after anyone in particular? The answer is no. <laughs> I went through a lot of different L names uh, before I settled on Leonard and uh, I actually have my mum to credit for that. She put the idea into my mind. I had a few other um, possibilities floating around, um, but I definitely wanted to stick to the tradition of children's books in naming the character with the first letter of the, the name of the animal. So yeah, alliteration is very important in children's books. It rolls off the tongue. Um, and are there any animals I want to write about in the future? Wow, well, I really definitely want to keep writing about Australian bush animals because they are so mysterious and wonderful and fascinating. And yes, I, I am just um, in awe of lots of Blue Mountains animals, actually, especially their the black cockatoo and um, 
The Bowbird. I've written some stories that I'm hoping will turn into books soon um, about featuring those two birds. So I think they're really um, interesting and have lots of character. So I'm hoping that they'll appear in a future book. Uh, let me just scroll back to the Facebook feed. Ah, so Rose has asked, finally, what is next for Leonard? Thank you for asking, Rose, because this is a very exciting time um, for Eloise and I because we have just started working on our next book together. And I'm sure everyone will be really excited to know that it's sticking with the Leonard series, but this next book is going to be about Lila. Yes, it's going to be Lila the Lyrebird. And we're so excited to announce that we're We've just launched a crowdfunding campaign on the crowdfunding platform Possible, um, where you can go and make a pledge and uh, to, to pre-purchase a book and all that money will go towards creating Lila the Lyrebird. So you will in fact be helping make the next book come to life. And we both realise that it's, it's a very testing time for everyone at the moment, especially financially. And um, this did come into consideration about whether we should run a crowdfunding campaign at this time. But we felt that Lila the Lyrebird is a really inspiring, hopeful story. And I think that people in this time of the coronavirus and being um, isolated socially, we really need to um, connect with the arts and with storytelling and things that make us feel good and um, give us hope in this world. And I feel like this project between Eloise and I can provide that sort of light at the end of the tunnel for people. It'll help our community rally around something that's important to us and um, have a positive thing to look forward to. So yes, we are running that crowdfunding campaign for the month of April and we're really excited uh, to bring the story of Lila to life. She's, she's an interesting character, she's pretty deep and um, she goes on her own journey of self-discovery and um, overcoming some sort of limiting self-beliefs and she tells a very inspiring story that also weaves in um, the idea of bushfires which have ravaged our um, the Blue Mountains National Park and a, a lot of Australia this summer. So um, I will be including a link to that possible campaign at the end of this uh, live stream. So you can all pop over there and check it out and hopefully pre-purchase a book. So thanks Rose for giving me that segue, but I'd really like to answer some other people's questions. I'm just gonna scroll through um, and see if I can see any other questions from uh, readers. It's always fun when I'm doing readings at schools to hear the kids' questions. Um, often they come out as <laughs> random, random comments about what they're doing or that they saw a lyrebird one time and <laughs> hopefully we get a few from other people. Let's see, everyone's giving good feedback. Oh, look, here we go, from Beth Peck. Dylan Peck asks, what is a bunyip? Well, Dylan, that is a very good question. Let me open up to the bunyip page. I know that children are very curious about this page. What is this sleeping creature just here? So in traditional um, Aboriginal culture, the Bunyip was a mythical figure that um, the elders would uh, tell their children about to stop them from going to places of danger. Um, so it's a bit of a boogeyman kind of uh, uh, character. Um, but it also, also the Bunyip was said to protect the mob. Um, so it, the, the bunyip filled the role of protector but also um, a, a means of scaring off 
kids from dangerous places like water holes or caves or things where kids weren't supposed to be. So the bunyip, is the bunyip real? Uh, it's, it's sort of a, a possibly just imaginary, but um, you can come to your own decision. But um, definitely um, imagined very vividly in this book. All right, let me scroll down for any other comments or questions. Oh, we've got lots of lovely feedback here. Hmm. Ah, we've got one from Rebecca McFarlane. Have you done any other children's books? Thanks for the question, Rebecca. I haven't, but as I just announced, I'm going to be doing another children's book, Lila the Lyrebird, um, which we're, we've just launched the crowdfunding campaign for, and I can tell you it's going to be a really great beautiful, um, beautifully illustrated story, uh, again illustrated by Eloise Short, and it includes all the same things that you love about Leonard, so the rhythm and the rhyme, the um, intrigue and drama, um, and also incorporates uh, an element of the storyline, incorporates bushfires, so it'll give um, children, especially in our community and all over Australia, Sort of help them um, connect to what that all means and what that means for Australia's flora and fauna. All right, any other questions? Oh, look, we have a teacher question from Crystal Ray Moggs. Hi, Crystal, thanks for your support with this book. Um, will you leave this live online so we can share with our students? That's a great question. It does stay live online for 24 hours, but I will. Uh, download it and I'll put it on my page um, permanently so that you can revisit it in the future. Thanks for that. Um, I can't see any other questions. So, oh, hang on. Yeah, but if you have, a, if you have another question, just shoot it through to me through my Facebook page. Um, you can also go to my website. Um, and email me through there your questions and I can I can do some live Q&A's um, in the coming weeks because I know we're all going to be stuck at home and um, or at daycare or preschool or at school and needing things to do so I'll, um, I'll be answering those in the future and you can also if you want a copy of the book you can I know that a lot of uh, Blue Mountains bookshops are um, still operating online and are doing free local home deliveries or um, posting out books so you can buy them from there or you can jump onto my website jodiemcleod.com slash books and order from there or from my Etsy store so you can still purchase uh, this book in hardcover or softcover and um, yeah so that's where to get the book. But let me just check out if there are any more last questions. Uh, I have something from Estella, who's eight years old. Why does Leonard mimic other animals before finding his own voice? Well, if you've ever seen a lyrebird in the wild, Estella, you'll know that the, the superb lyrebird, the superb male lyrebird, loves to mimic other animals. And he does it in the wild to attract a female lyrebird, but also to um, also to uh, defend um, himself from danger or defend his um, yeah defend others from danger. Um, so in the book, why does he do it? Well, Leonard, as it says, he was born to perform. He just loves performing. Um, and just wants to imitate everyone else because he thinks all the other exciting calls are more exciting than his. And um, But then Lila, you'll see, comes in and says, the simpler the tune, the sweeter the song. So she's looking for something a bit more authentic. And it takes Leonard a while, but he discovers that his authentic voice is the one that really connects him with Lila. So the message is to always... Sing in your authentic voice. Find your inner voice and, and trust it and just be you. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I might call it uh, an end to it there. Um, as I said, this video will be on my 
on my page for 24 hours and then I'll put it on there permanently so you can come and uh, look at it again. But in the meantime, I'll put up the link to our possible campaign and I really hope you can get behind the next book, Lila the Lyrebird. She really needs your support and I'm sure you'll find it's a most beautiful and wonderful story and these books are going to make a fantastic pair on every, everyone's bookshelf in the future. So thank you Rose, thank you Blue Mountains Cultural Centre for, for this opportunity and I hope we all get through this pretty difficult time and keep reading to each other because reading stories is what brings those moments of joy into our lives which we so much need right now. Thanks guys, I'll see you later. Bye! <laughs>